Okay, and I think this is all I need to tell you about the logistics. So let's get started with the program itself, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Patrick Cousseau as our first speaker today. Patrick does not need much of an introduction. Everybody knows him and his work anyway. Uh, he got his PhD in 78 from the University of Grenoble um, on abstract interpretation, which he and uh, his wife Radia invented, as we know, published a year before that in 77 and then 79. And he really changed the way we think about program analysis today, the way we do theory, the way we implement tools, the way we reason about program analysis. Much of that uh, that's happening today is based on his uh, work, and it's uh, a great pleasure that he's here today to share some of his latest work in the area. I'm not going to give a longer introduction. If I start enumerating his awards and prizes, we might not terminate before the coffee break. So I just hand over to Patrick, and uh, thanks for being here. Perfectly sure, yeah. So we have two plugs, we try the other one, it works. So <laughs> it's not symmetric. So I'm going to speak on abstract induction. And to start with, I am going to speak about concrete induction, which is easier. And concrete induction uh, is involved in any formal proof of a non-trivial program that is with loops and so on. And because programs are proved by mathematical induction, that is by recurrence or something like that. So you have to invent an inductive argument, which is either an invariant or variant function or something like that. And this is the hardest part. Because when you speak to mathematicians, they just give you the inductive argument. They never give you the proof. They, if you know the inductive argument, they think you are able to do the proof. Then to do the proof, you have a base case like entering the loop and then an inductive case where you do one more iteration or something like that. And finally, you prove that this inductive indu invariant is, uh, argument is strong enough that this is implied the property that you want to prove. This is because in general, when you want to prove a property, it's not inductive and <laughs> Like in math, when you prove a theorem, generally you have to prove a stronger fact than the theorem itself. So when you are confronted with this problem, the first thing uh, computer scientists do is to avoid the problem. So you can go unsound. This is not for scientists, I think. <laughs> you, <laughs> you can do model shaking. This should not be either for, uh, for scientists because it's a bit trivial. There is no <laughs> induction <laughs> involved. You see, I follow the politically correct remark. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> then you have deductive methods that are quite popular also with uh, theorem provers, proof verifiers, uh, SMT solvers. There you avoid part of the problem because you ask the poor end user to provide the inductive argument. So he is doing all the work, and then the machine is doing the trivial one. So uh, it's still difficult to make the implication, but you are not responsible if the fault of the prover. This is never your fault. Then there are guys that do financial abstraction. I am one of these, but not very often, and that's completely equivalent to what is called predicate abstraction, which is just a reformulation of a finite abstract domain. And it's also a bit trivial because you have only finitely many possible statements that can be inductive in the abstract domain, so you can check all of them. And this has a lot of limitations, and I will try to show you by an example you see, if you take a program like x is zero while x is less than some constant and then I increment, if I know the constant here, I know the abstract domain that I can use to make the proof that at the end it's uh, something like one. Uh, or, or in the loop it's between zero and uh, the bound. <coughs> and uh, for each program, there is a finite abstract domain that will allow me to make the proof and so people conclude, because any abstract interpretation is finite, you can always do it with a finite domain. Yes, that's true for one program. But when you take many programs, that is a programming language, then 
<coughs> it's no longer the case because if you have a finite domain, you will miss some zero n. And for this zero n, you will not be able to make the proof of the program, whereas if you take in Chavez, they will do it without problem. So this shows that if you have a finite domain only approach, you can do for one program, but it doesn't scale to a programming language, and to scale to a programming language, there are ab infinite abstract domain that will always do better than you. So you will be always beaten by someone using an infinite domain. And it's because when you do induction, the inductive argument that you find in the infinite domain, there are many more than in finite domains. So your chances of success are much larger. So one other approach to avoid the difficulty of using infinite domains is refinement. That is, you take a finite domain, you fail for sure, you refine, you refail for sure, and you go on like this until you get out of time. So, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> or, or memory. So uh, in that, I will just explain a bit more formally. So in the case you have a Galois connection between a concrete domain of property, that is, that is the semantic domain, that is the property, that is implication. This is the abstract domain, abstract uh, implication and the Galois connection between the two. What we do, we comp compute the abstraction of the collecting semantics, which is the strongest property of the semantics of the program. And uh, sometimes we have an exact abstraction, that is the abstraction of the collecting semantic, is exactly the abstract semantics. And sometimes we have an over approximation because uh, uh, the abstraction loses information on this inductive argument, and so there is no way to have equality. But in both cases, we are sound, that is, if the, 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 some, some property over approximate the abstract semantics, you are sure that the semantics have this property. So when it might be possible that although you have the best approximation, or, or in the case, yes, even if you have a best approximation here, or in that case, it might be the case that uh, you find some abstract argument, but it's, it's inductive, here it, sh it shows it's inductive, but it does not imply the property that you want to prove. It's not strong enough. So the result on uh, completeness is that it's always possible to refine the abstract domain I started with, in, into an, an, another abstract domain which is more refined. Um, and so that I will have this commutation property which imply this equality, which imply that I can make the proof. So that's a result by uh, Jacobazzi. He will speak about it. And uh, <coughs> though this is really good news, that is, you for any program, for one program, you will always be able to prove anything by abstract interpretation. The proof is a bit trivial, in fact, and it doesn't tell you how. Which this is a problem in mathematics, the mathematician, they never tell you how you prove their theorem. They just prove theorem. And you have to train yourself to do the theorem yourself. So uh, that's the same problem in abstract interpretation. So now there are also bad news <laughs> And uh, the bad news is that sometimes you have property where you have an, an intrinsic incompleteness. That is, the only refinement that I can do here is to identity. And so you have to go to the semantics to make the proof. There is no way out. And so I will give you a very simple example. It's, uh, it's kind of model checking in a finite space, but it's completely undecidable. And to do that, what I do, I consider a f an infinite future, which is the case in model checking, but also an infinite past. I, I got this idea over the Atlantic. I was thinking my plane is going to fly for five more minutes. So why? So I, I said it's not because we departed from Paris, it's because 
the previous five minutes, everything went okay. So the next five minutes, everything will go okay. I don't have to start from the beginning. So even if my plane had been f flying forever, then if it goes five minutes, good. Next five would be good also. Maybe not 10, but 10. So you see the idea, you have a time origin, but you don't care. You have just a present time, the past and your future. And the operators are really classical. You can say something on the state. You can say something on the next transition that you are going to do, or the next state. And then the, the conjunction, the fixed points. And you have this operation, which is reversal, which exchange the past and your future. So you take the previous picture. You turn it around here, around I. So you turn this. So you exchange past and future, so your logic can speak on the future. So now you have extended exchange, so you, it can also speak on the past. This operator allows you to speak both on past and future. And so now you can say something like, in three minutes there will be something because 10 minutes before there was something that happened. And so it, half an hour later there will be something. And the, because one hour before, we had something. And so with this operation, although the space is finite, you can go to infinite, infinite things that can happen. So you are reasoning in, in a finite state of space, but the domain of property is an infinite domain. And so this is the source of incompleteness. If you want to do model checking, that is, you, you look for the traces that, that whenever you have an execution like this that goes through one such state, there will be a property of the future, which can be also of the past by this reversing. So if you want to do this, or instead of the for all, you can do also the exist the past, then uh, you have this abstraction that maps uh, traces to traces of sets. And the, the interesting point is that we prove that there are, uh, this abstraction is incomplete, as we proved that in uh, the original paper. And then Jacobazzi and uh, Ranzato prove a much more difficult result, which is any refinement of this abstraction will be incomplete, except if you go to the identity, which is no abstraction at all. And so you see, even with finite state, so model checking is working, not because it's finite state, it's because it's finite state and a very limited expressivity of what you can prove. If you go to something more expressive, then even finite state are not enough and uh, you will always fail with any abstraction to prove everything in this uh, language. So in practice, you, you get this situation. You see, I have represented here the, what is called the lattice of abstraction. That is, here you have identity, it's the most refined abstraction. And here you have a, I don't know. That is, you never know anything. That is, you always reply, reply that all cases are possible. And in between this lattice, the points are program properties, like here, some, some signs, or some here, you have intervals, and so on. So what you do, you start with some abstraction, here, say, and then you start refining. And if you are not lucky, you are going to refine forever, because below you, you, you are in more and more precise abstract domain. Below you, there is none which is inductive and strong enough. So you see, if I start from there, I have complete abstraction, it works. Here, they are all incomplete, this one. This one is the only one which is complete here. And so this explains why refinement is a question of luck. You see, if you are lucky at the beginning, you start with the right stuff, or unlucky, you will get a result or none. So having a method based on luck is good if you believe in probabilities for uh, doing a <laughs> program verification. So here is a little example. Uh, it's a, a filter. It's a filter is something that takes a signal and, and smooths it. And uh, here is a possible abstraction, which is uh, here. Uh, it's uh, take it boxes or any, any uh, any convex uh, polyhedra will do. 
when you you make one loop iteration, you see it's it the invariant turns a little and shrink. So you have a point outside. So if you want to remain in boxes, you have to make a larger one, and this will go forever. If you do refinement, you will get this. You have a point outside, and uh, you see that the next point you will refine is one of these, and it will go on forever until you cover the whole area here. So the only refinement that works is an ellipse. And uh, to get this from a linear abstraction to an ellipse, you have to understand this and then say, yes, that's an ellipse, and the an ellipse will work, and you have to understand why. It's because if you turn and shrink, it remains inside the ellipse, which is not completely trivial. So uh, this also will never terminate because you have to cover all points. And so if you don't go to an ellipse and stay to set of points or polyedra or things like that, you will go on refining forever. So uh, in general, you need a narrowing to stop uh, this. So a trivial one is uh, 20 minutes. And uh, so SLAM now is abandoned, which is a uh, pity because uh, in the original paper, they claim that they were successful in 98% of the cases, which is always possible because you can just show the cases that work. So that's... Uh, <laughs> And so it takes 15 years to see that the 2% of the cases were the one you meet most often. So, <laughs> so the only problem is that intelligence is needed for refinement. And so uh, this is uh, still an open problem for, for some time. So now if you want to face the difficulty, you have to do an induction and in the abstract. Uh, and that uh, I will discuss uh, now. So uh, if you want to do sound software uh, static analysis, we n you need some form of mathematical induction. It must be done in the abstract because it must be in some domain which is representable in a machine, and mathematics are not in general. And uh, it, it's also, it should be also such that if you apply in the abstract, it's valid in the concrete, so that the whole all stuff that we have to discuss. There's the abstract domain that you consider to represent the, the inductive argument should be infinite because we have seen the finite ones that don't work. Then uh, the, the inductive argument must be strong enough to imply the property. So again, this encourages you to take complex, rich, abstract domain because you can express a lot, but it must be inferable in the abstract, and then you want the simplest things possible because if the abstract domain is simple, then it's easier to, to make inference. So there is a tension between expressivity and uh, inferability here, which is uh, the problem that we have to solve. So, um, I'm a very dry mouth, so I have to... Ah, yes, I have some water, excuse me. I will take some water because I have a very bad... So it's opened. It does not explode when you... <laughs> it's a splash for the... So I will skip this slide because you spend too much time on it. And uh, <laughs> no, it was just you have either track interpreters that reason on transitions or, or others like Astray that, that reason on the structure of the program. But in both cases, you have the same problem. This doesn't solve any of the problem that we consider today. So in general, you have uh, some ordered structure, which can be a pre-order. It's a bit more difficult. Then you have a transformer that make, uh, the, that simulate the effect of an induction step, and you want to compute a fixed point with good hypothesis uh, to, to, to have the fixed point which exists. And we are in this situation that I represent this way. You see you have all points in D here. Then you have the points here for which f of x is less than x. Here you have the one where x is less than f of x. If you are in a poset, 
here you have the fixed points and uh, the classical method for finding the fixed point is to iterate from bottom and so you remain in this area until you reach the smallest of the fixed point here and you are done. The problem is that this will be infinite in general in an infinite domain. So the, the trick in the convergence criterion, when you reach something which is such that f of x is less than x, then you are sure to over-approximate over the least fixed point. And this is coming from Tarski theorem or variance because there are many, many variants of this theorem. So the first thing is widening. So let's go to widening. You have uh, this increasing function that I have represented here. You have the iteration here. And you see that it's, it's converged slowly to the fixed point. And we would like to accelerate this, uh, this uh, convergence. So what we can do here is instead of taking the function, we can take the, the tangent. And if we take the tangent here, we will reach a point here, which is such that f of x, so you have x, f of x is larger than, than x. And so uh, you see f of x here is larger than x, which is here. And so you are sure to be above the fixed point. So the inventor of widening is Newton. And uh, this is uh, <laughs> not bad. Uh, that guy, and uh, it's, it is reinvented recently uh, by, by these people here, and they call this a newton raphson uh, method for static analysis. The problem is that it's not always easy to define what is uh, a derivative or the tangent, and when you go to narrowing, it's not trivial to find one because it, it doesn't guarantee that if you take a tangent, it does not guarantee that you are below the, the, the point where you started. But it's an idea. So just a little reminder, where, uh, when you do extrapolation by widening, you start from bottom or something below the fixed point. Then either you, the next iterate is a post-fixed point, that is, it satisfies the convergence criterion, and so you have found the result, or it doesn't, and then you make an extrapolation of the previous iterate by the next one. And the widening is based on two independent hypotheses. The first one is you do an extrapolation, that is, the result here will be larger than this one, and independently, you can enforce in convergence of increasing iterates with widening to, to the limit. So th these two criteria are independent. And uh, in my thesis, there were two chapters, one on widening, one on enforcing convergence. And many people say, ah, I have a widening, but it does not enforce in convergence. So it's not a widening. So it's not really true. Then the first widening where this one, you see that's funny because at the time there was no text editor, so the bottom was a big square, and this one. And uh, so this one is a, a later one where we had forgotten these two cases to make it simpler. This one is interesting because it's, it's coming a few years later. It has a threshold, that is, when you do a widening, you, if you go through zero, you stop at zero before widening to plus infinity. So when I go down, I, I go to zero or minus infinity. When I go up, I go to zero or plus infinity when I am larger. So th this, this shows that you can always refine the widening here by putting more and more threshold. And so whenever you give me a widening, I will be able to give you a better one just by adding some, some threshold like this. So there is no best widening, and so that's encouraging. You can publish forever by improving your widening, <laughs> and this is discouraging because you will never make it. <laughs> so the idea is this, you, you start from bottom, you compute the next iterate, and you take these two elements, you widen, and this gives you something larger. You compute the next iterate, from these two, you widen. This gives you something larger until you reach something so that the next iterate will be a post-fix point. That is, when you go to apply the f to this, this point, it goes down. 
OK? So uh, one, one problem with widening is that they are not increasing. And this is an example. You see, you have the one one, which is less than one two. And if I widen one one by one two, I get one plus infinity. And it is not included, a little shift here, in one two widened by one two, which is one two. So you see, this is smaller than that. Uh, the say is the same, and the result is larger here. So we prove that it's not increasing. And so in fact, that it, it's not possible to have uh, uh, an increasing widening, because if you have a widening which is increasing its first parameter, which enforces termination of the iterates and does not do over approximation as soon as you have found a solution. That is, when you have a solution, the widening will not degrade the information. Then if you have the, these three cases, uh, you cannot have these three properties simultaneously. So in practice, uh, we want to enforce the termination. We want to stop losing information when we have a solution. So it cannot be increasing in the first argument. Obviously, if you take something like widening to top, it's increasing its first argument. It enforces termination, but it doesn't satisfy the last solution. So it's not good. So let's go to the narrowing. Uh, let's show the picture first, maybe. When, when we were going down, you can go on going down maybe for forever and to, to slow down the progression to, to enforce the convergent when you go down, you can use a narrowing. So you start from the point where you, that you have reached previously, and then you, you narrow the previous iterate by the next one when you strictly decrease, and you take the next iterate to be the solution when the next iterate is a fixed point. And again, the narrowing has two independent hypotheses. One is that you stay between the two values, so the, the previous iterate and the next one. The, way the, the narrowing is between these two values. And uh, so it's an interpolation. And it enforces convergence of the decreasing iterate infinitely many steps. These two hypotheses are, again, independent. and. Uh, there are many widening, narrowing that, that do not satisfy the second. For example, you just take the narrowing to be the, the argument f of y. In general, it, it is a narrowing by the definition, but it will not converge in general. So this was the first, first narrowing ever. And uh, it just take the, the, if the previous iterate has a, an infinite bound, it takes the one of the next iterate and otherwise, it just takes the minimum of the two, and if uh, it's the same for the upper bound. So it eliminates the infinite bound that have been introduced by the widening. So it, it works like this. You see, you have an iterate, the previous one. You take something in between. You go on applying the f. You take something in between until you reach a fixed point. There is a. So now that you have reached a fixed point, you, you are blocked on the iterate. Uh, if you go on iterating, you, you are blocked here. So there is a notion uh, of duality, which uh, was in my thesis too, and which I made explicit in my thesis on widening, because I thought it was not perfectly clear for people. And in the other chapter, I say duality is a trivial notion. I will not go on typing two times the same thing uh, with the sign upside down. At the time, it took very long to retype the same thing. It's not now. You see, you just have a program to, to write the dual of your paper, you see. And uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the duality uh, uh, is this. We have seen these two, the widening and the narrowing. So it's for widening was for an increasing iteration. The narrowing was for a decreasing iteration. And uh, the widening star from below, it arrived above. 
and the narrowing style above and arrive above the fixed point that you are looking for. So they are not dual. Now, if you take the dual, you have a dual narrowing, so it starts above and arrive above. Uh, it starts above and arrive below the fixed point, and uh, this one, and the dual narrowing will uh, dual narrowing will start uh, below and arrive below. Okay. So you see that uh, the widening, they are extrapolators. They, they go outside two consecutive points, and uh, the dual narrowing and uh, narrowing, they are interpolators. They, they go in between two su successive points. So here are all the possible uh, iterations. You see, with the widening, you have a fixed point. You start below, and you arrive above. With the, the narrowing, we start above and arrive uh, above. And uh, we, we were using the same point here previously. And this is a dual. Um, uh, you start above and you arrive below, and you start below and you arrive below. So uh, <coughs> oh, all, all these uh, extrapolators, I use only two successive iterate. Obviously, uh, this is uh, an option. You can also use three, four, five, any number, and you can also make a widening on all previous iterates. And uh, this is obviously more precise because you can follow the evolution of the computation on a longer time. So the more you know about the computation, the more you can uh, you can uh, guess the the future iterates. So the examples are loop and rolling, where you, s you s don't do widening at the first iteration in the loop, like in astray, or delayed widening. You do a widening, and then you make some iteration in the loop to accumulate information before doing one more extrapolation. So, so let's go to dual narrowing. Um, dual narrowing, uh, you start from below at the bottom. You iterate the, the, so this, this is one, uh, one way of using the dual narrowing. What I do, I, I do a dual narrowing between the next iterate and the point where I stopped after the narrowing. So remember this point, yeah, which is this one here. I want, I want to improve this, so I restart from bottom, but my iterate are guaranteed to remain below the point I have found. So I am sure that I will find something which is at least as good as uh, the point where I arrived here. And uh, it may be that I find the same at the end, but it may also be that I find the most precise one. So uh, the iterates are like this. I start from below. I take the next iterate and I do a dual narrowing with the point I want to stay below of. And I do this when I have not a post-fixed point, that is, I have not reached the zone of stability. And when I have reached the zone of stability, then I, I, I deliver the last iterate, which I know was stable. So the, again, the dual narrowing has two independent hypotheses. One is uh, when the next iterate, this is a previous iterate, that is the next iterate, or that is the limit, then I choose something in between. I, it's an interpolation. I don't want to, to be aware that what I have found before. And the second hypothesis, which is independent, is that uh, the, the dual narrowing should enforce convergence of these iterates infinitely many steps. So here is an example of a dual narrowing. You see I have an interval, I have the next one, and I take something which is in the middle. You see I take the middle of this, and I take the middle of this. So uh, if you imagine that this was the point I reached with the narrowing, you imagine that my infinity is some number, like in machine, like maxint or something like that. I can do this operation, and I will try to improve by finding something in between. This was the first thing we tried with Radia to solve our equations, but uh, we did not insist because 
finding the middle here is not really easy when you have non-numerical uh, things. So we thought, yes, that's nice for interval. It will not work for other things. That was a big error. So uh, here is the picture, you see. You take the next iterate. Then you have the point that we want to stay below. Uh, of, and uh, we take something in between. Here I've taken the middle, say. Then I reapply F, and I take something in between the uh, two points here. I reapply F, and uh, at some point I have reached a fixed point, hopefully smaller than this one. In the worst case, it will be the same as this one, and I will have made no, no improvement. But in the best case, I will have really improved uh, this, uh, this initial point. So I, I illustrate that with the case where you uh, start with something that you have obtained by widening and then narrowing. But it can also be used uh, by uh, Macmillan. It was used uh, as a, where this point is given by the specification of the user. And so you can do this iterate with narrowing to improve the specification by the user to try to, fo to find something which is uh, inductive and strong enough. My point doesn't need to be a fixed point here. I have never made the hypothesis that this y was a fixed point. It can be anything, even not comparable. And uh, that's it. So uh, just to make the point, the Craig interpolation, you see you are given p, which is a logical formula, which implies q. So this is a previous iterate. This is the next iterate. And you are able, with Craig interpolation, to find something in between. Oh, next iterate, uh, excuse me, it was the user specification in the case of, of uh, Macmillan. And you find something in between with the additional property that the variable of the interpolant is included in the intersection of the variable of p and q. But this hypothesis is just an extra hypothesis. It's not needed in the correctness of the, of the result. So it was observed already by uh, Da Silva and Aller that it, it is a narrowing. In fact, it's not a narrowing. It's an inverse narrowing. We will see why next slide. Uh, but uh, they had the idea. And the problem is that I may not be unique. So you may have to try many to, to know which one works best, or you have to be lucky, which is the same as trying many. And uh, it may not terminate, so you can say after two days of trial, I will uh, stop, uh, I declare that I cannot make it. So what is the relation between uh, narrowing and dual narrowing? It's just the inverse. So <laughs> It's a very strange property. You see, when you have a narrowing, it says this is a previous iterate. This is a previous iterate. This is the next one. It's decreasing, and I find something in between. With the dual narrowing, you see, you say, uh, this is my uh, objective. I want to improve this. That is my next iterate, and I pick something in between. And we, when you write it this way, you see that you just invert the two parameters. And so if you know a narrowing, you will know a, a dual narrowing either by just inverting. The problem is that the, the narrowing might, might be nice. Inverted might not be so nice. That is, it might be uh, some, something which is not adapted to what you want to do. But formally, it's, it is this relation. So uh, another thing which is interesting is bounded widening, and it's related to the things I have shown before. So when, when you have, I uh, will drink a little. It's, it's very dry in the, yes, is it? Yeah. Huh? So when you have a dual narrowing, you have the, the thing you want to to prove, um, you have the next iterate. And essentially, you, dual, you do a dual narrowing. There is a missing little hat which moves there, here. So uh, the, the next iterate with the objective, and you, you want it to be 
larger than the next iterate to accelerate the iteration and more precise than the specification not to overshoot the, the specification. So you do an induction on the next iterate and the specification. So, uh, a bounded widening is, uh, I think it was first used by Alvax for polyhedra to, to force polyhedra to, to remain into a box. And uh, the idea is this, you have uh, the next previous iterate, the next iterate, you know that you would like to be in some box because, uh, for example, uh, it's a machine integer, so you know all machine integer must be in some box. And so what you do, you do a, a bounded widening, which is like a widening, but which ensures that the result will be smaller than B. So in, in that case, you have an induction on the previous iterate, the next iterate, and the box. Whereas here, you had only previous iterate and the box. And as I said before, when you do an induction on a larger past, you have better chance to be precise because the whole trick of widening is to extrapolate the previous behavior in the future. And the more knowledge you have of the previous behavior, the more chances you have to get the future right. Uh, this is well known in finance. They don't do that on one measure. They do that on uh, extrapolation on many, many, many measures to be uh, more precise. And so here is a, a bounded widening, which is, uh, you see the previous iterate, the next iterate here, you have the box here. And what I do, I take the middle of, uh, the two like I was doing before, and I retake the middle with the, the box. It's just a suggestion, you see. It's a so that uh, this way of computing will take into account the previous two iterates. So if, if it's converged slowly, it will be uh, more precise, and if it converges fast, it will be less, if it Oh, it is converged slowly, yes, it will be fast, excuse me, because you see, I will have a little increment here, but I will have a large increment here. If it uh, grows fast, I will have a large increment here and a smaller one here. So it's a, it's a, it compensates more or less the speed of convergence with the objective to try to find something that uh, grows smoothly, in a sense. So that's it. Uh, when you have a dual narrowing, you can always do a bounded widening, and it can only be better. So uh, it's time to finish. No, what, what time is it? Yes, so I, I am finished almost. So uh, one point is that uh, you must be sound. And recently, I wrote a paper on which this, this presentation is built where I try to have minimalist hypothesis, that is where I say the minimum hypothesis to have the result I want to have on widening and things like that. So the first thing is that there is no need for lattices, uh, partial orders, and, and so on. So the only need is to have a concrete domain which, has a, which is a poset. So in the concrete, this is always true because it marks you, you, the fixed point equation for invariant, for example, are a poset, even a concrete lattice, and they have a, a least fixed point which exists. Then the abstract domain can only be a, a pre-order, and the concretization is the only thing you need. It doesn't need to be defined everywhere. It needs to be defined only for the iterates. Then uh, the concrete transformer is increasing, but there is no need for any hypothesis on the abstract transformer. In particular, when you have nested loop, the inner loop might contain widening. This will not be increasing. So the outer loop transformer will not be increasing. And so it's useless to have this hypothesis on increasing. And uh, the soundness hypothesis that I express in the, in the abstract, if you express them in the concrete, you don't even need an order in the abstract just to make the comparison for stability, but elsewhere you don't need it. 
So uh, this uh, is independent of the termination property, which is an another independent property. So conclusion, you will be happy. Uh, the challenge of verification is to infer an inductive argument and without deep knowledge about the, the program. That is, uh, if you ask uh, the user to tell you exactly what this program is doing, uh, it's a bit cheating because uh, the real difficulty is finding this inductive argument from the program only. The other thing which is difficult is to scale. And uh, to finish, I will give you my favorite example. This is a filter that is something that takes a signal and smooth it. This is a simulation of the input. And uh, my specification is that, what is the interval of value of these two, uh, S of zero and S of one? And uh, if I ask the user, they don't know, because they are engineers, they have made the proof in the, in the real, and they know in the real, and this is flawed computation, and they don't know. And even they make errors. For example, they take, you see, I have rounded because the numbers are secret, so this is not the real number that I have in the application, but the sum must be one, in the, if you make the, the sum. And when they use real, it is one, but then when they move to floats, uh, there is a little error which is introduced, and this creates an instability, and no one is aware of this. So one influence was that now they enter in hexadecimal, the float in hexadecimal, to make sure the compiler will not make different choices depending on which compiler you have, and they will do the rounding themselves so that the sum is one, and this improves the result. So the challenge is this, what is this number? And this is one possible number. And uh, giving this to you is of no help because it's not inductive. And the induction is this little ellipse that we have seen. So you have to refine this interval into an ellipse to find the interval. And this is a box around the interval. This is a challenge of software verification. You have to say something that you don't know and in a way that uh, is completely different from the things that are told to you. Uh, that's, uh, that's it. So, uh, is traditionally done. Huh? You have shown dual narrowing. This is uh, old ideas, and uh, recently there was this instantiation with Craig interpolation. And it can also be used as this idea to improve fixed point when you are blocked after widening narrowing. And at the end, thank you. I am on time or not? Uh, uh, have done better. Thank you very much. Uh. So, Patrick, uh, there's, as you know, there's a lot of work on composing program analyses. Yes. And I'm wondering whether in this abstract induction, does it lend itself to composition as easily, or they comp uh, or there's some complications if you want to compose uh, yes. inductive so, hypotheses. Uh, you have to be careful because uh, if you do, uh, the, the most common composition is by the reduced product where you make the conjunction of separate analyzers. It might happen that uh, you have a convergence in one it is domain, but when you do the reduced product, you lose the termination property because some, some domain is doing a widening. The other is saying, wow, this is too large. I will make it smaller. It transfers the information to the domain that have uh, made the widening. We say, ah, I have improved. And then it made the same widening, and this goes forever. So you have to, when you do the composition, you have to reprove the termination property, not the soundness, the termination. Thank you. Yeah, I had a question about this next to last slide when you say no requirements or no hypothesis on the abstract transformers. So uh, what, what do you mean? Like no uh, requirement. Uh, that, yeah, that is a no uh, mono, mono increasingness or monodicity. Uh, you must say that they over approximate. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. But you okay. don't need to say they are increasing or monotonic or things like mm -hmm. that, which is the hypothesis that everybody does, and uh, which is false with widening. Right. Mm -hmm. But you have to say that you over approximate. Right. If you take bottom, uh, it, it doesn't work. So I was a bit oversimplifying, but uh, in my head it's clear. <laughs> <laughs>